Well, thank you, Michael, and uh, thanks, of course, to Peter and to Chris for uh, getting me over the Atlantic and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about our work here. And this is uh, work uh, where we try to control the interaction of single ions and single photons in various ways. Um, it's going on, as Michael already said, at the Univers Universität de Saarland, uh, in a small place on the border to France in Germany. Um, as, a, as a little introduction, which is hardly needed here, uh, I'll show you this kind of vision of a quantum network implementation using uh, ion traps and then some photonic channels. And uh, um, Andrew just brought this up also in his talk this morning. And um, now if you, if you want to connect uh, ion trap computers or storage sites um, over some distance, then uh, there's hardly anything than photonic channels to use to connect them. And so in this, in this network implementation, the typical uh, idea is to use uh, ions as the storage nodes, as the, as the stationary qubits, and then photons as the flying qubits that connect these nodes. And uh, essentially, there are three classes of, of operations that you could uh, try to implement um, in order to get these uh, distant uh, ion trap computers or small scale uh, <coughs> quantum computers connected. And uh, one is this heralded entanglement because you need to, to establish quantum correlations, of course, between these nodes in order to get these uh, small individual quantum systems uh, to, to make them one big quantum system. So you, you need to get to establish quantum correlations. And, uh, and then uh, the first thing that people had proposed and uh, Actually, also the first thing that has been put into practice in this pioneering work in Chris's group uh, is heralded entanglement, where you, um, where you uh, make two atoms at some uh, also large distance emit uh, single photons, and then you put these photons on beam splitters, and then by some, uh, by, by some indistinguishability, there are actually two, two types of ways of doing this, by some indistinguishability, uh, from detecting uh, a certain signal on these detectors here after the beam splitter, you, you uh, deduce that these two ions become entangled. Yeah? Uh, this ha has been proposed, as I said, in, in, uh, by Cabrillo and, and Simon, and then put into practice in, in this work by, from Chris's group. But there are other ways of connecting these, um, these ion traps with, through photonic channels, for example, um, there was this proposal by Seth Lloyd and co-workers to transfer entanglement from photons to atoms. And, and this is motivated, of course, by the fact that uh, the, the sort of most robust and cheapest entanglement you can get on the market yeah, is photonic entanglement. And this is a spontaneous parametric downconversion source for entangled photons. And then if you, uh, if you take such a source and then you split up the entangled photons and send them to two distant uh, ions absorb them, uh, then you also transfer this entanglement to the ions. So this is another idea of doing this. And uh, the third uh, idea would be to uh, directly transfer a quantum state from one ion to, in, to another by emitting a photon here and sending it over a channel and absorbing it here. So you see that in particular in, in, in this and in this case, uh, the, the controlled absorption is an important point, And this I will address today with the work that we are doing. And uh, we are doing this uh, essentially with, in these two schemes. And I'll talk about our experiments. And, and here, probably one should mention that uh, there's, of course, some work by, by, uh, in, in the cavity QED setting of uh, Rempis group, where they take out a photon from a single atom in a cavity and then send it to another cavity where another photon is. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to address the, the difference to our work here. Uh, and actually, the, the, there's one big difference, and, and this is also one of, the, uh, one of the points that will become a, a motive in the whole talk. This is uh, heralded processes. Yeah? And um, because uh, none, none of these things can be done deterministically, and we cannot even dream of doing this deterministically, even if by using cavities or anything. So it, if you use these, uh, these processes, then they will always remain probabilistic, and then uh, the best thing you can get is actually uh, a heralding signal that tells you that your process has been successful. Yeah, and uh, examples are uh, heralded single photons where uh, you take these 
spontaneous parametric down conversion sources as, uh, as single photon sources where one photon, the, the presence of one photon is actually heralded by the partner photon. Uh, and uh, then uh, when we emit single photons from a, from a single atom, then uh, you can also talk about the, the trigger of this emission as a herald for the photon to be there. Yeah? Um, now, uh, this, uh, as, I, as I already said, this remote entanglement procedure is, uh, is also a heralded procedure. It's heralded by a Bell measurement on these photons. And uh, then um, in single photon absorption, uh, as I said, we need single photon, controlled single fo photon absorption here or here. And uh, there you might uh, identify also different methods of heralding the absorption, the successful absorption, either by a quantum jump, so the, the atom makes a real uh, state, uh, state change that you identify by the, the ion becoming bright or dark, or by a scattered photon. Yeah? And I will talk about both of this. Now, in, in heralding, there are uh, um, at least two figures of merit. And uh, uh, the first one is, of course, the conditional probability between process and herald. So how, how likely is it uh, that the process hap happens if you get the herald, and how likely is it that you get the herald if the process happens? Yeah. And the other one, the other figure of merit, which, which shouldn't be forgotten, is the, the action of the herald on the system. And there's, of course, a clear difference between uh, quantum jump herald and, and scattered photon herald, which, which you will appreciate later on as I go. Okay. So the, the outline of my talk is uh, I'll quickly present the experimental system that we use and then talk about uh, absorption heralded by quantum jumps and uh, for two types of single photons, as, uh, as photons from a spontaneous parametric down conversion source and for photons um, coming from another ion. And then I'll talk about the heralded quantum memory. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the absorption, the controlled absorption of a photon of, a, of arbitrary polarization, and then uh, uh, putting this arbitrary photon into the atom, and then making sure that the atom has a corresponding state after the absorption. Now I'll, I'll present the schemes and tools that we have, and then our very recent experimental results on this. Uh, starting with our experimental system, we use um, calcium ions. And uh, we use, as qubits, we either use uh, S1 half uh, Zeeman sublevels and D5 half Zeeman sublevels or uh, S1 half uh, Zeeman sublevels, so where, where we just split them by a magnetic field and, and use the two sublevels here as a qubit. Um, this is uh, uh, just a view of our uh, machinery in the, in the lab. And the, the important point, because we are working on these uh, networking <coughs> Uh, uh, procedures, we have two of these traps. And we have two independent traps on the same table uh, with calcium uh, in it. And uh, with the same, we look uh, at the traps with the same camera, and then it looks like this if we have ions loaded in the two traps. Now, inside these uh, vacuum chambers, uh, there's a, a traditional Innsbruck style uh, linear ion trap. And our particularity is that we have supplied this with two uh, uh, high aperture lenses which give us diffraction-limited uh, access, optical access, at essentially all the wavelengths that we need, uh, with about 4% of 4-pi uh, solid angle per lens. Uh, about the photons, so th there are different types of photons that, uh, that we uh, use in our works. And uh, either we get these uh, single photons from uh, an ion, uh, that means that uh, we have a triggered single photon source. We, uh, I'll, I'll, um, and uh, then, of course, if you do this right with a triggered single photon source, you even have uh, atom photon entanglement. So uh, it's not, not only a source of single photons, but already a source of entanglement if you, if you want to use this. But we also use an SPDC source uh, for photon pairs. And then uh, if you just put one of the two photons on an APD, uh, you herald the presence of the other one, then you have a single photon source in that sense, or we even use the entangled photons so because these are, these are polarization entangled, and then you have an entangled photon pair source, and, and, and that way a kind of fundamental resource of entanglement. Now, uh, the, the single photons from a single ion are produced in a very straightforward way. way uh, we use three of the levels, that, uh, of the many levels that we have available in, in the calcium. Uh, and f after some period of cooling and preparation, we switch off one of the lasers. For example, here the, the D2P laser is switched off. And then, of course, uh, within a very short time, 
the ion will be optically pumped into the D level and there will be one red photon released here. Um, and uh, then uh, if, if we then switch, on the, switch off the blue laser and to switch on the, uh, the red laser, there will be one blue photon released here. Yeah? And so it's more or less this, this uh, generation of single photons, in this case, it would be blue photon, but of course the process works also the other way, uh, how we uh, produce single photons in the lab. And um, uh, we can tailor the properties of these photons uh, uh, to quite some extent. Uh, we can give them a variable wave packet, which is uh, for us the arrival time distribution after the trigger, uh, uh, the trigger meaning the, the onset, let's take for example this initial level, this intermediate level and then photon emission on this transition here. Uh, after the onset of the laser pulse here, this, which is the trigger, uh, we get uh, photons at different times. Uh, we repeat this very often and then we get uh, for different powers on this transition, we get different uh, wave packets of these photons. Yeah? And uh, this scales nicely with the power that we apply. And uh, so we can change the, the duration of our single photons between, um, yeah, between a few 10 nanoseconds and uh, some microseconds. Uh, these photons, as, as we have shown some, uh, some time ago in this paper, are near Fourier limited. That means uh, actually the, the duration of this photon and uh, their spectral width, uh, they are in a, within a factor of two of the Fourier limit. And uh, in, a, in a newer paper, in this one, we also showed that we can actually, uh, in the sense of the Fourier limit, plus uh, also in the sense of uh, uh, tailoring the polarization of these photons, we can actually produce photons in a pure quantum state. Um, now, the other type of uh, single photons that we use are the photons from the SPDC source. Uh, we use a PPKTP crystal to uh, frequency down convert uh, photons that uh, are first up converted from 854, which is one of the transitions here in the, in the calcium ion. We up convert first by second harmonic generation to 427 nanometers, and then we down convert here and produce photon pairs which are centered about around 854 nanometers, only that they are much uh, broader uh, in their spectral distribution than what you need. And uh, so uh, then we, we split these photon pairs up here, and one of them is filtered by uh, uh, two cascaded fiber row cavities, uh, which are tuned to exactly the atomic transition that we need. Uh, with, uh, with frequency and, so center frequency and bandwidth, they are tuned to the atomic frequency. So, uh, when we receive a photon here on this detector, we know that there's a resonant photon in the other arm. Yeah. And uh, the, the bandwidth is actually deduced from, uh, from the ring down time of this filter here, which is shown here about seven nanoseconds. So the, uh, the bandwidth that we deduce is the 20, 20 something megahertz of the atomic transition. Um, these photons are not only uh, resonant uh, heralded single photons, but they are also entangled. So if we, uh, instead of using a polarizing beam splitter here, if we use a normal beam splitter and then you put polarization uh, analysis units in the two arms, which is done here, uh, then we can show that uh, there's actually polarization entanglement between the photon going this way and the photon going this way. Um, with the fidelity to, the, uh, to this uh, singlet state, uh, of uh, close to 98%. Um, now using these, these tools, I'll show you now uh, some of our experimental results. This is uh, the, uh, the first one being the absorption of uh, SPDC photons heralded by a quantum jump in the atom. So what does it mean? It means that, uh, um, that we put the atom now, so th this is, um, yeah, this is just uh, first introducing this method of the quantum jump signal that uh, signals single photon absorption. Okay, um, if we uh, shine the 397 nanometer and the 866 nanometer laser on the calcium ion, then it produces continuous fluorescence at a, as it's shown here, uh, some level. And then uh, if we add a little bit of 850 nanometer light, the atom will, after a short while, will be uh, pumped into the D5 half state. Uh, and this is long lived, about one second, and then the fluorescence for this time will cease. So this will be uh, a bright to dark quantum jump, which is induced by this laser. 
uh, and then the absorption of a photon that uh, takes the ion from here to here at 854 nanometer, which is shown here, this will induce a dark to bright quantum jump because then with a high probability from here the atom will be decayed down uh, back to S and start fluorescing again. Uh, of course, uh, this, uh, this absorption here or excitation that competes with the decay on the 729 nanometer. Uh, transition uh, with, with its lifetime of about one second. So um, this signal, the dark to bright quantum jump for us, is, is the signal that uh, tells us that the atom has absorbed a single photon on this transition. Um, we use this in the, in the experiment which is shown here. The ion trap is, is here with the two uh, high aperture lenses. Uh, this, is, this is the PPKTP crystal, um, light, blue light is down converted and uh, then the two, the two partner photons, they are split up at this beam splitter. One is going through the cavity filters and is detected. The other one is sent uh, through the ion, is polarization controlled. And um, then we look at the coincidence of a detection here, which tells us there was a photon, and of a quantum jump here. Yeah, and if we have a coincidence, that means that we can sort of uh, herald the uh, process of the absorption. Right? And this is the photon pair here. Uh, the herald is detected here. Sorry, I just I already explained this. Quantum jump is detected here. And um, I when we use the polarizing beam splitter here, then the entanglement actually between the photons is gone. So we are only sensitive to the time and frequency correlation between the, the two photons which are here. And uh, there are a few more numbers that uh, I'll go through them very quickly, but uh, you might be interested later in the details. Uh, important numbers are we have about 1% mode overlap when we shine in the photons through the lenses onto the atom. Uh, we have, uh, on this transition, we have about 6% uh, oscillator strength, which means that uh, essentially even diffractive, diffraction limited focusing only gives us a 6% probability of absorbing and not 100%. <coughs> and um, uh, but the, the photons themselves, they are, they are tunable, actively stabilized to this transition and uh, their bandwidth is also matched to this transition. Uh, the brightness at which we uh, create photons are about 10 to the 4 pairs per second of which we send about 5,000 to the single ion. Um, this is the, the pulse scheme, which is more or less what I already explain, explained, how we, how we now test the, uh, the heralded absorption. There's a cooling phase, then there's a state preparation phase where we put the ion into the D5 half state here. Uh, then we actually optically pump it in the D5 half state to the outer Zeeman levels, and uh, by sending in uh, single photons with the right polarization, uh, we might get a quantum jump indicating that this single photon has been absorbed. Um, and uh, then we calculate the correlation of absorption, so quantum jumps that means, and the heralding photon, and we see that around zero, we get this peak out of uh, the noise. This is the noise coming from spontaneous emission and, and essentially uncorrelated events. Uh, so in the sense that uh, we see this peak, yeah, we, um, with, uh, with not such a high fidelity as you see, uh, but uh, we can actually herald the absorption of the single photons coming from the, uh, from the down conversion source. The absorption rate here was uh, about 1.5 per second. The absorption efficiency, so how, how likely it is to, to absorb a photon when we know there is one, is about 3, 10 to the minus 4. And the, the probability, if we absorb, that we actually get a, a herald also for the photon is 7%. Uh, so th these are essentially the two, the two probabilities for the heralding, the two conditional probabilities. Uh, we did a similar experiment now with photons coming from the other ion. And uh, that means that we established essentially a photonic channel between two ion traps. You know, we, this is the sender ion trap where we release single photons now on this, in this case on this 854 nanometer transition. So we pump the ion up uh, to the P3 half with three lasers and uh, release uh, these 854 nanometer photons. 
they are picked up and sent through a, an optical fiber to the other to the other ion trap, the receiver ion trap. And here we use uh, exactly the same ion, uh, uh, the same quantum jump detection scheme in order to uh, detect whether a photon coming from here has been absorbed or not. Yeah, we do this at about uh, 30 kilohertz repetition rate or up, up to 100 kilohertz we can do. Um, we, in this case, we used uh, one microsecond duration single mode photons. A single mode because this is a single mode fiber. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and this one kilohertz is essentially the reduction uh, how often we actually pick up a photon and send it through the fiber. Yeah? So this is the one kilohertz is the, is the highest rate of single photons that arrive at the other ion. Yeah? This is the repetition rate of the whole cycle. And uh, we, we see that we absorb these photons uh, now again with a similar probability as before. And here this G2 function is, uh, is also showing uh, that uh, we can correlate the event of sending a photon, which is uh, the trigger, and, uh, and uh, observing a quantum jump here, which uh, is the other event. These two events are correlated here. And you see this is now time resolved. Um, uh, from here to here, this is the repetition rate of the of the whole process, and the whole thing is is time resolved. So um, the uh, the rising uh, actually the falling slope is easier to understand. This is the the wave packet of the photon. Yeah? This gives us a falling slope. So in this falling slope, we see the wave packet of the photon, and in this rising slope, we actually see uh, the uh, the um, the limited the the, the the limited rate at which we detect photons in the quantum jump scheme. Yeah? So we have to wait for the first photon uh, after the absorption has happened. And this comes uh, not immediately, but uh, within about uh, something like five, uh, yeah, how much, about uh, 0.5 microseconds. And so this, uh, this gives us this rising slope. But there's a cr clear correlation again between uh, the trigger that uh, with, with which we send off the single photon and the quantum jump, which indicates that the single photon has been uh, absorbed here. <coughs> so this, uh, this is essentially uh, uh, now a primitive version of connecting two, uh, two ions over really some macroscopic distance with, uh, uh, where we take out one photon from one ion and uh, absorb it into the other ion. Now, as, as I have already mentioned uh, in the beginning, because we detect here with a quantum jump, now the state of this photon is not in any case, in, in, in any way preserved in the atom after the absorption. Yeah. Uh, and so this, this is what we address in the final uh, experiment that I would like to show, the heralded quantum memory. And here uh, we, fo we follow a principle which is quite easy to uh, understand. Um, uh, an atom is, um, is prepared in an in initial state, which is a single quantum state of some kind, or a coherent superposition, but it's a pure quantum state. Then it uh, may absorb uh, two different polarizations, yeah, which then form the basis for the polarization qubit of the photon. Uh, these two different uh, absorption channels uh, both release uh, a scattered photon on a different transition. It may even be the same transition, but uh, now here, also in our experiment, I, I use a different transition. So uh, this releases a photon on this transition. This absorption releases a photon on this transition. And then uh, the atom ends up in, uh, in a superposition of these two final levels, which represents the superposition of these two absorbed polarizations. Yeah, this is the mapping of the polarization to the atom. Yeah, it's quite straightforward. As you see, the, uh, there, there are uh, a few requirements, though. Of course, you need to polarization control the interaction. Yeah, so we, we, you need to use the Zeeman structure of your atom in order to do this well. Uh, you need to detect this photon in order to know that the mapping has happened. Yeah, but in this particular case, if, if you do this right, then this this herald is, uh, can actually be a very good herald yeah? Yeah, because uh, you only get this if this absorption has happened and then you actually know that also the mapping has happened. Yeah? But uh, there's one uh, condition on this herald is that these two heralding signals, they have to be indistinguishable, of course, yeah? because otherwise you know which polarization has been absorbed. 
Yeah, so uh, this has to be made sure. And then, uh, of course, for the state analysis afterwards here, you need means to coherently manipulate this, this atomic qubit. Yeah. Um, for the calcium ion, uh, these schemes look slightly different, but we identified a few possible schemes. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, show you uh, one. So one is straightforward. This is the one that we also then uh, implemented in the experiment. Uh, you start with the coherent superposition of these outer Zeeman levels in the D5 half state. And then obviously uh, um, one of the sigma polarizations leads up to here. The other one leads up to here. And then there are only, uh, uh, for each of these upper levels, there's only one possible decay channel into the ground state. Um, and uh, so in this way, uh, the, the coherent superposition plus the polarization of the photon are mapped into the ground state here after the, after the absorption and the decay. Now, uh, as I said, uh, you have to make these two decay channels indistinguishable. So uh, one has to make sure that uh, this decaying photon is detected in a basis that projects these two on each other, yeah, which is easy, uh, just depends on the geometry of your experiment. And then uh, uh, because of these channels, these absorption and emission channels being the only possible channels in this way, this is actually the most efficient scheme that one can implement with the calcium ion. Yeah? This, is, uh, this is more or less the same. You can start in the plus minus, D, plus minus three half uh, Zeeman sublevels of D5 half. Um, and then you see uh, you can even use essentially all the emitted photons uh, in different ways. You only have to, again, project them. But still, uh, this is only 50% efficient uh, compared to this because of the klebsch gordon co coefficients of the involved transitions. Now, uh, these, these two look, look a bit uh, complex because one has to start in a superposition in the D level. Um, uh, and we identified also other schemes which actually work without the superposition. You can start in a single Zeeman sublevel and then uh, absorb, and there are uh, too many arrows here to, to explain them now in detail. Uh, but if, uh, if, if you use a certain geometry and uh, use a certain herald, uh, then you again map the photonic uh, polarization to the final atomic state after the scattering process. Uh, this is much less efficient than the others. And there's another scheme here. Now, uh, so we set out uh, implementing this scheme. And um, uh, so how much time is left? OK, so uh, before I come to, these, uh, to the experimental results, I would like to show you a little bit more on polarization control. Mm -hmm. And so this gives me the, the opportunity to talk about another experiment. So it's a little bit of an inset now, uh, where, where we show that we can actually uh, nicely control the basis of absorption in the polarization basis of absorption. Yeah? And uh, this is an experiment, again, with the, uh, with the down conversion photons. And here we use the entanglement of these photons. Yeah? And uh, the experiment is such that we send in, now we, we use the entangled pair. One of the two photons uh, is detected, but it's detected after polarization uh, manipulation. And uh, so essentially, uh, whatever we detect, because it's a, it's a psi minus state, whatever we detect here after setting these uh, polarization rotators, uh, the, this photon will have the uh, orthogonal polarization to this one. Yeah, in, in this way, we, we control essentially which photon uh, arrives here. And uh, then in order to absorb yeah, a certain polarization, we can set the magnetic field here uh, to give us a certain basis in the atom. Yeah? So uh, this is the basis in which we uh, detect uh, the heralding photon. And by uh, setting the magnetic field on the atom, we, we set the basis for the detection of the other photon through the quantum jump scheme. So again, this is the herald. This, uh, this uh, detector looks at the quantum jump. And uh, everything else is uh, the same as before, only that now we uh, include the polarization entanglement of the herald and the photon that uh, is absorbed. And uh, uh, here, you, here you see now, um, when we set the magnetic field 
uh, direction along the propagation of the photons, then uh, it is clear that um, uh, depending on the initial state of the atom, uh, either the sigma plus or the sigma minus photons can be absorbed. So if the atom is pumped into these outer levels, then only the sigma minus photons are absorbed and vice versa for, for these outer Zeeman levels. And by this, uh, we can control which polarization is absorbed and which isn't. And um, uh, essentially, the, in our setting, the ion absorbs only the right circular uh, photons. So that means if we now correlate uh, the absorption events detected through quantum drums and the, the herald, um, we, we expect to only get um, quantum drums when we have a, a left polarized photon, left hand polarized photon here on this detector. And this is what is, uh, what is seen here. So this is the half wave plate that determines the angle of the, of the detection uh, of this photon. And here we have, uh, we have high correlation, and then this correlation goes down to essentially background. When the two uh, settings are such that uh, we detect here the same polarization as the one that can be absorbed here. OK, and this, then we did this in, in, in three polarization bases for the mm -hmm. atom. And we always found that uh, it is always the orthogonal polarization that, uh, that is absorbed at, uh, in the ion to the one that is detected here, which uh, in the end is essentially a, a detection. So this is the third basis. It's a diagonal basis, which is in the end a, a manifestation of the entanglement of the photons only that we detected here through the uh, absorption in a single atom. Yeah. So this is a proof of the polarization of uh, the photon of the polarization entanglement of the photon pairs, but as a detector on one. Uh, on one side, we use a single ion to absorb these photons. Uh, but it also shows, and this is, the, this is why I included it here, that we have uh, essentially uh, full polarization control over the uh, absorption. And uh, if you want, you can consider this experiment also in, in a different way. You can, uh, you can say this is kind of remote controlled spectroscopy, you know, because everything that we change here uh, on, on this axis is done here. In the in the herald, yeah, we don't we don't change much at the ion. We always send all the photons to the ion. We can change the polarization here, and then uh, we see that the uh, the coincidences between <coughs> the detection here and the the absorption they they vary with uh, whatever we set here. And the same is true actually for the frequency we showed this earlier. When we change <coughs> the frequency, when we shift the frequency of these filters here then we see that the, the absorption probability goes up and down because we always look in coincidence. <coughs> OK, so coming back, uh, this, uh, coming back to, the, to the scheme of heralded quantum memory, I'll show it again to make sure that. So that we are now uh, talking about this scheme. Um, and uh, what has become clear, I think, already uh, is that the heralding that we uh, employ here, the heralding by uh, a single photon emission, is exactly the same as the single photon creation that I have explained before. Yeah, so we, we, uh, we put the atom into the state, uh, wait for the atom to, abs to absorb a photon, and then uh, another photon comes out. And this is the single photon creation, only that now we consider this single photon a herald for the absorption. And uh, finally, um, uh, the initial state, as I said, has to be a coherent superposition now. It has to be a pure quantum state, coherent superposition between these outer Zeeman levels. And uh, we uh, prepare this coherent superposition using uh, yeah, an ultra-stable laser on this transition and an RF drive on this transition. So uh, there's, a, there's a pulse scheme in order to create the superposition, which is that first we pump the ion into a single magnetic sublevel of the ground state. Uh, then with the pi over 2 pulse, we send 50% uh, of the population up here. Uh, the remaining population is taken with an RF pi pulse to the other uh, sublevel here. And then with a, with a laser pi pulse, it is taken up here. And then we have this coherent superposition. And in order to show that this is a good coherent superposition, now I show you the result of a Ramsey experiment where we do this and then do the whole thing reversed. Yeah? So this is without any photon scattering. We do the coherent state preparation 
and then we reverse the whole thing and um, this is the Ramsey signal but for zero waiting time yeah and we scan in this case we scan uh, the phase of the final pulse that uh, uh, that actually puts these two populations together and um, and then we see the essentially 95% contrast in this uh, Ramsey experiment, meaning that uh, we are actually able to create this coherent superposition that we need as the initial state for the absorption uh, with a, a very high fidelity. So then um, starting from this, uh, the experiment, uh, so this is the, the, the first, uh, this is what I just explained, this is the first step of the preparation of the coherent superposition. Then we send, uh, we send photons to be absorbed we can send them in uh, any superposition of sigma plus and sigma minus. And then in order to show that the final state which we get after detecting this herald here is in, in fact a mapping of this superposition, we need to apply a readout and this is, uh, works again with an RF pulse that, uh, that rotates uh, the, the state, the qubit state and this ground state and then with a shelving pulse on one of the two magnetic sub sublevels. So it's a typical shelving scheme. Um, and uh, the geometry is such that uh, now um, these sigma photons, the so photons that we want to map into the atom, that we want to store, whose sta polarization state we want to store in the ground state of the atom, that these photons arrive along the magnetic field axis. So this, is, uh, this gives us a possibility to essentially use any superposition of sigma plus and sigma minus. And uh, the, the herald here is detected at 90 degrees, so in fact we can only be, this, this herald can only be sigma plus or sigma minus, and if you look under 90 degrees to the magnetic field axis, it will always be a vertical polarization. <clears throat> and also by this way, the, the, the polarization of these two possible heralds is erased, yeah, we have no information uh, about the scattering path. Here. Okay. And uh, the, the geometry is shown again here. Uh, these, this is the ion. These are the two lenses. Um, the photons are actually sent in this way. And uh, in this uh, first experiment, we use simply uh, uh, weak laser pulses as, as photons. Of course, if there's, a, if there's a scattering event, then a single photon is absorbed. Yeah? We, don't, we don't send uh, any kind of uh, pure single photons. We send laser pulses. But of course, there's never more than a single photon absorbed here. And, uh, and then uh, the, the herald is picked up with these, uh, with these high aperture lenses and uh, goes to one of the detectors here. Yeah? And this is the RF coil, which is just beneath the, the ion trap. Um, this shows you the, um, the arrival time distribution of the heralds. Uh, and again, this uh, looks very, very similar to single photon creation because it's actually the same as single photon creation, only that we now have full polarization control. And, um, uh, and this is shown in these two plots. So the first plot shows you the arrival time distribution of the herald. If we send uh, sigma polarized 854 nanometer photons, yeah, and uh, this is the arrival time distribution conditioned on the subsequent detection of a certain atomic state. Yeah? So this is conditioned on the detection of one of the two qubit states yeah, in the atom. Yeah? Now, uh, of course, if we send sigma polarized light, yeah, then uh, essentially we only get um, one type of photons. Yeah? Uh, and uh, the atom ends up always in the ms minus one half state. Yeah, and never in the MS plus one half state, or never with uh, some noise on it. Yeah. Um, and uh, now, if we send linear photons, uh, then the arrival time is uh, is shown here. And again, this is the arrival time conditioned on subsequent detection of the atomic qubit in a certain sublevel, yeah, in the in the two basis states of the qubit. And what you see here is uh, that now the arrival time is modulated and this 
represents the Lama precession of the superposition. Essentially, the Lama precession, which the, the initial superposition which, with which you start, is already, already Lama precessing, and you have to follow this rotating phase throughout the whole process. Uh, therefore, it is important that in order to now map the, uh, the, the linear or any, any uh, polarization of the incoming photon to the atom, you actually have to record the arrival time of the photon because it carries a phase in it yeah, that you have to take out in the final state analysis. Okay, good. Yeah, um, doing this. Yeah, so taking out essentially this this phase which comes in through the detection to, th through the detection time through the arrival time of the herald. Uh, now this is the essentially the central result of the memory operation. This is the S one half probability after the analyzing pulse. Yeah, and the, and the shelving for various incoming polarizations. And so here the, there are four linear polarizations. And what one sees is that, uh, um, that the four polarizations, they actually lead to four different superpositions in the, in the ground state, yeah, which are different by a phase always of pi over two. Yeah, and this is exactly what you expect. So we essentially, we sorted the incoming photons uh, according to their arrival time, and this we took out this phase, we ordered them by this phase, and then we see that uh, that the v, so the vertical, horizontal, anti-diagonal, and diagonal polarizations, they get uh, they give us superpositions in the atomic state, which are uh, rotated always by 90 degrees. Yeah? And so this completes essentially the uh, the analysis that shows us that the uh, the linear polarization is mapped into the corresponding superposition of the photon of the atom. Okay, the, the preparation phase of the D5 half uh, actually adds in. So if we shift the, the phase of the D preparation pulses, then uh, we can also shift this signal as before. Uh, this is not su such an important result, uh, only that it shows that we have a full phase control over this. Uh, and in conclusion, I have shown you uh, uh, some examples of controlled uh, single photon emission and absorption in a single ion uh, absorption of resonant entangled single photon pairs, interaction between single distant uh, uh, ions through single photons, and then uh, heralded quantum memory for single photons, where the, uh, the polarization degree of freedom of an incoming photon is mapped into the atom by a heralded uh, process. And this heralding is actually a very good herald. So when we receive this herald, then we know that the mapping has happened with high probability. Uh, there are more de some more details on a poster by Christoph Kurz this afternoon. Uh, and I thank my people for the work that they did on this, uh, the organizations who paid the bills, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jürgen. I think we have time for one or two quick questions. Yeah, but the last part. What is your heralding probability and what limits your polarization purity? Yeah, so um, the polarization purity, you mean the contrast of these signals, yeah? Uh, there's some factor in it which, well, there are a few factors in it. The initial preparation is, of course, uh, important, yeah? But uh, since we showed that this is 95%, it cannot explain the whole reduction here. And there's actually one factor that we don't know yet, yeah? Uh, it, from all that we can measure individually, it should be higher, but. Uh, this is what we get consistently right now. Uh, the other question was the heralding probability. The heralding probability. Um, so again, the the absorb now the absorption probability cannot really be uh, taken in this case because we send laser pulses, so we offer essentially many photons. But per photon, if I send uh, so per photon coming in, what is your probability of seeing? Per, per pulse that uh, comes in, the probability for the herald is between one and one and a half percent. The pulse yeah. contains hundred. The pulse, how many photons does the pulse contain? Christoph, how many photons are in a single pulse? Many. Many. So, <laughs> so, so many that the that essentially we get absorption every time. Yeah. So if we did this with single photons, then there would be another factor of yeah, ten to the minus three or below. In, in success probability of the whole scheme. 
yeah. But I mean, out of considerations of measurement time and, and PhD time, yeah, it was easier to do this first with laser pulses. Okay. Yeah. One more in the, the earlier part of your talk, uh, you, sh you said in, I guess, both experiments that the absorption probability for a single proton was something like a few times to the minus four. Yeah. How much of that is sort of spatial mode and how much of this is spatial mode? Yeah, I, I gave some numbers, but I, I went quickly over them. So uh, there's one big factor is the 6% um, oscillator strength on this transition. Yeah. Um, so it means that essentially, uh, even if your geometry is perfect, yeah, you have essentially an in incoming dipole wave, you only get up to 6% absorption probability. Yeah? This is one big factor. Then the geometry is about 1%. Yeah? And then, uh, yeah, the rest uh, to some extent is unknown, but uh, we, we believe that this is still geometry, so it could actually be made better, but uh, the alignment of this is, is a nightmare and takes, uh, of course, a long time. And so we, we end up with maybe about 50% of what we could ideally get uh, geometry-wise. Okay, so I think in the interest of time, I think we thank you very much again. And yes.